Check one, two. OK. Guys, ready? Hi, folks. Thanks for showing up. So um, we're about to start. Uh, today we will do a session with you called uh, OpenStack and Hadoop 101. Um, sorry if anyone will not see our black slides here. I was actually I was actually thinking that it will be like usually in OpenStack summits with the large projectors. Anyways, uh, we'll distribute them after after that. So if you don't see anything, no need to take the picture all the time. Um, so uh, today we will do the session. Uh, we originally called it "Getting Big Data Cloud," uh, getting big data cloud done right. Eventually, we renamed it a little bit, calling it "Getting Big Data Cloud." Um, Building, building blocks in place. I will explain later what's the difference here. So uh, we will discuss a couple of things. Uh, we will discuss the main use case for a virtualized big data uh, solution on top of uh, OpenStack Cloud. What's the difference to running on bare metal? Uh, what are the building blocks on OpenStack layer? What are the building blocks on Hadoop layer? So we will do an overview of Hadoop ecosystem, an overview of OpenStack ecosystem, and how these two map together, technically. So how, uh, what you can get out of agenda, but how Project Sahara puts them all together and how it works in practice. And we will do a discussion about the, some of the best practices and some of the known problems and questions which exist in this area. So some of the gaps uh, which are not yet closed for OpenStack, some of the gaps which are not yet closed for Hadoop, and some of the testings and certifications which we are still yet to do. So I'm Dmitry Novakovsky. I'm product manager X pre-sales at Mirantis. And together with me, I have two more folks today. My name is Sergey Lokhyanov. I'm PTL of Sahara Project in OpenStack. And uh, I'm a principal engineer in Mirantis leading the big data track. Um, oh, it's working. OK, great. Uh, I'm Trevor McKay from Red Hat. I'm uh, one of the Sahara cores. Um, I've been working on Sahara for uh, two and a half, three years. So right, folks, to ask questions about Sahara, that's for sure. Uh, before we start, i like to do a quick quiz. So uh, can you please raise your hand if you're running OpenStack Cloud in uh, POC or later phase today in your organization? OK. Uh, now can you please raise your hand if you're uh, running big data workloads on top of OpenStack? Great. OK. So the rest of the folks are here to, to, to see how, is, how it's actually can be done. That's good. So um, some, a couple of words about use cases. So those of you already running will probably know the words. Uh, here on the slide, you see like two dimensions. So one dimension is technical use cases, right? So how can uh, the big data solution be consumed out of OpenStack Cloud? Uh, the basic and the simplest use case is obviously to whatever, provision a Hadoop cluster on top of uh, virtualized OpenStack environment, consume it directly like you would consume it from any any other solution, any other bare metal deployment. Uh, another use case is Elastic Data Processing, or EDP, the separate API endpoint exposed by uh, OpenStack Sahara project, which we will, talk, we, will, we will discuss in details later, which allows to create uh, open, uh, Hadoop clusters on demand on top of uh, a running OpenStack cloud. So not, not pre-provision it and then run the, work, the data processing job on it, but actually provision it on demand for a job that you already have. Uh, the third approach would be to tap on the workflow engines on top of pre-provisioned uh, on top of pre-provisioned Hadoop cluster on uh, on OpenStack, uh, and that's the one dimension from for the technical use cases, for the business friendly use cases, for those of you who need to whatever justify <laughs> introduction of uh, big data solution on top of uh, OpenStack. There is a really nice white paper from Cloudera. And here is the link for it uh, called 10 Hadoopable Problems. So those of you who are still struggling to get your management to approve the project for it might benefit from using exactly this one. Now, uh, we'll I, I will hand over to Trevor to do an overview of a uh, little bit of a history of Hadoop ecosystem and its current state today. And then we will get into showing you how the Hadoop ecosystem maps to OpenStack ecosystem today. Sure. All right, thank you. <coughs> so uh, this is my timer here to make sure I don't go over. So 
we'll start the countdown. And uh, if it goes off, then I'm done. Um, let's see. Uh, there we go. OK, I can work the buttons. All right, so what 101 class would be complete without a little history, right? Um, we always have to have a history lesson. Hadoop, uh, as we know it today, really began at Yahoo in 2005. Um, they had a lot of uh, searching to do, a lot of pages to rank, um, and, and they started looking for a solution. So it turns out that uh, Google had published some white papers uh, in the early 2000s um, on a distributed file system, also on the MapReduce algorithm. And Yahoo uh, picked it up and, and started working with it. So things go on. 2008 is a, is a big year uh, for the project. Um, Cloudera is formed uh, in a separate effort. Um, Yahoo moves Hadoop to Apache and is now a, a full Apache project. Um, 2011 comes along, another big year. Um, Hortonworks is spun off from Yahoo to focus 100% on Hadoop. Um, and Apache releases Hadoop v1 in December. Uh, 2013 comes along, and we have um, version 2 um, with some improvements that we will uh, talk about soon. So that is kind of the, uh, the beginnings. It grew up pretty quickly. So today, we have a choice of multiple Hadoop distros. Um, there is the Apache project itself is the upstream. It's the foundation for everything. You can find all the pieces there. You can pull that stuff down and run it. Um, but we also have some uh, uh, commercially supported distributions. Um, and these are the, the biggest ones out there. Um, you have CDH, which I believe stands for uh, the Cloudera distribution, including Hadoop from Cloudera. Uh, Hortonworks data platform from Hortonworks. And you have the MapR distribution. Um, all of these are supported by Sahara, by the way. So you can run vanilla uh, Apache Hadoop or any of these other three. Um, let's see. OK, so what was the primary problem uh, that they were trying to solve? You, you probably know this, but we'll go over it anyway. So the, the problem was, how do we search uh, or run analytics on data sets of ever-increasing size? Right? It's not megabytes and uh, gigabytes anymore. It's terabytes and petabytes. Right? So how do you do that? Um, and the answer is divide and conquer. Uh, this is not necessarily a new idea. If you go back to the 80s and 90s, if you remember you know, all the development and excitement around quicksort, right? same idea. Break stuff down into smaller and smaller pieces, solve the problem, and reassemble. That is uh, exactly what MapReduce does in, uh, in a parallel fashion. You take your data set, chunk it up, throw it out to a, a pool of servers, uh, get intermediate results, and then reassemble them. And uh, anything that is... Um, Anything that you can decompose into smaller uh, chunks and uh, process independently is a good candidate uh, for a MapReduce type approach. OK, so what are the, the common components uh, in Hadoop? Uh, there are basically three, and we'll talk about the fourth one in a minute, which is really just a refinement. Um, Hadoop Common is uh, sort of like Oslo in OpenStack. It is, it's the kitchen sink for all the common libraries, right? So anything common across multiple modules uh, goes in Hadoop Common and is not you know, reproduced elsewhere. Um, HDFS is the distributed file system. Um, all the data and executables are pushed around a Hadoop cluster using HDFS. Uh, MapReduce is the data processing platform itself. Originally was, I think, Java only, but there are a bunch of different language bindings now. So you can write uh, MR uh, programs in, in uh, C++ and uh, Python and probably other things. Um, Yarn is a resource management uh, and scheduling component. Um, you'll hear if you do some research about Hadoop version 1 and Hadoop version 2. And so the distinction between those is really this. Um, initially, MapReduce uh, handled the data processing platform as well as all the resource management. It was one big monolithic piece. And in V2, um, Apache uh, broke the resource management uh, and scheduling out of the MapReduce piece and put it in Yarn. The advantage of that is that Yarn now is general purpose. You can actually use it for other stuff. Uh, it can run uh, any framework you want it to, as long as you write an appl uh, application master class. See what my timer says. Oh, great. Plenty of time. OK, so what does HDFS look like? Um, this is a, a, a pretty simple diagram. A uh, high-level view of HDFS. 
basically you have a name node. Um, the name node tracks where your data is, right? Uh, your data exists on data nodes. It's replicated across multiple data nodes um, for uh, high availability. And when you have a client that wants to interact with HDFS data, it asks the name node, well, where is my data? The name node responds, tells the client, oh, your data is on these data nodes. And then the client goes out and uh, reads and writes the data nodes directly. Um, so that is HDFS in a nutshell. And, uh, HDFS really underlines a lot of things. There are, there are different processing frameworks. We'll talk about a couple of those uh, later on. But um, really, this HDFS component of Hadoop sort of uh, uh, undergirds a lot of them. I'll also mention that uh, HDFS is as much an API as it is an implementation. So there are things like uh, GlusterFS and uh, from Red Hat, um, MapR has their own implementation of HDFS. Um, the, the map, I forget what the term is, but it's the MapR uh, file system. Um, so there are a lot of uh, possibilities there. Uh, we'll also talk about the YARN architecture here a little bit. Um, there is a single resource manager. This is very analogous to what we just saw with HDFS. Uh, the resource manager um, talks to node managers um, on each of the execution nodes. Uh, and then for each framework that you run, you'll see the little uh, purple uh, circle there, or oval. That's the application master for uh, a framework. And so what the application master does is it, it goes back to the resource manager and says, hey, uh, I need you know, uh, this amount of resources to run this framework. And then the resource manager allocates it. Uh, and the node manager is kind of the middleman uh, managing all that. Um, MapReduce itself in Hadoop has its own application master uh, that's included. So obviously, you don't have to write that yourself, and it's deployed uh, for you. But that's really what's happening under the hood. All right. So this gives you enough to write the typical Hello World uh, Hadoop app, which is it's probably word count, right? Take a book, um, read it in, and then find out how many times each word in the book appears, right? That's sort of everybody I know. That's their first Hadoop app. It's very impressive. Um, but you need, you need more, right? That's not enough. Um, we've got the core, but we need other stuff. So in production environments, uh, you want things like cluster monitoring. Um, if you have complex workloads that are, you know, are expressible as a graph, you might have synchronization points where, OK, you know, tasks you know, one, two, three have to finish before task four can go on. Um, you've got migration out of legacy data systems um, or back and forth across frameworks. Um, so those are some of the, the kinds of things that you need. And uh, writing MapReduce jobs is not always easy. Um, you want high-level scripting, right? You want more expressive things so you can get your job done faster. You want a, a SQL-like front end um, so that you can query uh, big data databases uh, as if they were SQL, right? So all of these sort of desires and, and things people found as they started using to Hadoop uh, led to the development of a pretty rich uh, ecosystem. Um, and we'll talk about just a few of those things here. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of them, so this is just a handful. Um, Pig lets you write scripts. There's a language called Pig Latin, and this is sort of freeform scripting uh, over Hadoop datasets. Um, it compiles them into uh, as many MR jobs as it needs, and it, and it runs them for you, so that's very nice. Hive is a SQL-like query language. Um, you've got Uzi, which is a uh, job scheduling and management system. Um, Sahara actually uses this under the hood. Um, it supports uh, pretty complex um, DAG-type jobs. If you know what a DAG is, it's a directed acyclic graph and basically uh, multiple jobs with dependencies. Um, Zookeeper, um, I think a lot of people here know about Zookeeper. It's used in other instances, but uh, you can use it for high availability and synchronization uh, and distributed config. Um, HBase gives you, I believe it's, uh, uh, I always get this wrong, it's millions of, uh, millions of columns by billions of rows, or, or it's the other way. I can't remember, but it's really big. That's the point. So HBase lets you look at really big databases. Um, HCatalog gives you some interoperability support across, uh, you know, when you want to use your data in Pig and Hive and MapReduce, um, 
H catalog gives you some metadata that, that enables that. And you've also got scoop for moving stuff in and out of uh, Hadoop and legacy systems. Um, this is just a handful. There are many, many more. People are making new projects around this stuff all the time. Um, and there's also stuff outside of Apache, uh, like uh, Hue, Nagios, Ganglia, other things that are being added. So there is a, a very rich ecosystem here. Um, so wow, you know, how do I choose? Uh, how do I know what's, what's going to overlap? Um, how do I know that it's going to work together? Um, what version should I use? Have I forgotten anything? Well, this is, this is where the distros help you out. Um, they answer that question. So here's a typical uh, HDP deployment. Um, you can see you've got multiple uh, methodologies under the data access layer. Uh, there's pig there, MapReduce. Um, it's got Storm. Of course, HDFS and Yarn are still there. You've got things like security um, and governance around the outside. Uh, you can see Uzi on there. So this is a subset that uh, this looks like HDP version version two, um, but this is a subset that that Hortonworks put together um, to give you all the uh, all the capabilities you want. Uh, likewise, there's something here from CDH, very similar uh, in that it has HDFS and Yarn at the core, but they'll they'll choose uh, uh, services a little bit differently to give you the same uh, capabilities. Like for instance, they have Impala up there doing SQL, right? So distros are your friend. They uh, help make the choices for you. Uh, and as obviously, as new services come online, these companies release new stuff. Uh, and the beautiful thing about this is Sahara gives you access to all of them uh, simultaneously. So um, you don't have to choose. You can have everything. So <clears throat> great. Uh, I hinted at Sahara a little bit. But then uh, the next obvious question is, how does this all map to OpenStack? Right? How am I going to get this on my cloud? Hey, that's my uh, alarm. Perfect. <laughs> so um, I'll hand it over to Sergey at this point. Uh, thanks very much. Okay. Okay, let's take a look on it from the OpenStack point of view. Uh, so what's the place of big data in OpenStack? Um, obviously, it's a it's a workload on top of OpenStack. Actually, there is another place for big data for the uh, for the cloud infrastructure itself, for example, for uh, logs processing and management, uh, etc. But let's take a look on a workload part. So uh, in OpenStax, big data implemented by the Sakara product. It's the code name of the officially integrated data processing program in OpenStack. Uh, so as it was already said, it's some, there are two main goals of Sakara project. The first one is uh, provision and operate the data processing clusters, and the second one is uh, schedule and operate data processing jobs. And uh, from the Sakara point of view, we're working not only with the Hadoop, but with the data processing frameworks to uh, support the new ones uh, on demand with a pluggable approach. So for now, uh, for in Sakara, data processing means support for the Hadoop Spark and Storm. Uh, so how Sahara works, actually it's fully integrated inside the OpenStack and uh, like if you go from the user point of view, we have a spreaded dash dashboard inside of Horizon uh, that exposes all of the functionality of Sahara through the UI. Uh, it uses Python Sahara client and uh, Sahara integrated with uh, OpenStack identity um, and using heat for uh, for the underlying resources provisioning, such as virtual machines, instances, uh, API addresses, volumes, etc. Uh, so starting with Mitak, uh, with the heat usage for provisioning will be the only option. So uh, like, there will be no way to use directly the services without heat. <coughs> so for uh, for the external data storage, Sahara uses Swift as a default uh, object store in OpenStack, and the uh, Sahara integrates with Swift to uh, to enable it as a file system for Hadoop uh, to be like, uh, transparently used as a file system from the Hadoop jobs. So some some words about the current state and. Uh, 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 ecosystem of Sahara in OpenStack. Uh, so as I already said, it is an official OpenStack project for like last two releases, I think. Um, 
So it was initially started with uh, Mirantis and uh, Red Hat and Cochrane drugs joined. Uh, and so, so we have uh, now much more contributors. Uh, and uh, for example, we have vendors contributing their own drivers. For example, Mapar fully supporting their plugin inside of Sahara. Okay, so about the provisioning part, uh, the main and most interesting part from this uh, provisioning stuff is uh, that Sahara provides end users ability to manage all of the configurations layout uh, for the Hadoop clusters. So in Sahara, there is a template mechanism uh, that provides users ability to specify the whole layout and configurations, manage them, uh, uh, and uh, create the clusters from the templates uh, many times. So you can have a template and reuse it, for example, for the bare metal and virtualized deployments. Uh, there is a concept of not group templates in Sahara that uh, consists of the specification of the uh, process that will be executed on a, on a node. Uh, it's, in fact, a role for the cluster node. It could be, for example, master worker, and it could be a list of the processes of Hadoop that should be executed. In addition to it, it contains uh, OpenStack flavor to specify number of CPUs, RAM, and etc. that will be uh, used for the virtual ma machine creation. And uh, there are some uh, storage and networking specific configurations such as uh, singular volumes uh, or um, net networkers that should be used to allocate the uh, IP addresses for the cluster. Uh, the another template type is a cluster template and it specifies list of not group templates with the uh, numbers of instances for each of them. In addition to it, it specifies some cluster-wide configurations like affinity for the, for the processes inside the cluster or some cluster level Hadoop configurations like replication factor. Um, then Sahara checks, uh, uh, checks the configuration before st actually starting the cluster. So it validates number of services, configurations for them, etc. Um, based on the already created cluster, you will be able to scale up and down the cluster using Sahara interface just by changing the number of instances for the node groups. Um, here is an example of the template uh, for the HDP cluster. Uh, it consists of the three node groups. The master node group uh, contains a name node, the source manager, history server, and a bunch of additional services like, for example, Ambari that is used for the actual cluster provisioning. Um, and it could contain some, some other master services, for example, like HBase, HMaster. Uh, the another node group is a, is a worker node that contains actually the main uh, worker processes for the Hadoop is data node for HDFS and node manager for Yarn. Uh, and we could have a secondary name node uh, that will, uh, like, uh, it'll be a node group for a secondary name node uh, uh, for Hadoop and, uh, for example, for Uzi server and client. So. Uh, this uh, three types of node groups build the, the cluster topology and uh, we could reuse it uh, to create the clusters of the exactly the same configuration uh, to reproduce the uh, same configuration. Uh, so a few words of the supported distros. Uh, right now we in Sahara support three vanilla plugins. It's named vanilla because it's just a uh, upstream uh, uh, packaged versions of uh, frameworks. It's Hadoop, Spark, and Storm. And we support three vendor distros. It's uh, HDP, CDH, and MAPAR. Actually, uh, all of the plugins uh, supported or were initially supported by, by the vendors. For example, HDP plugins were written by Hortonworks initially. Uh, Cloudera plugin were written by Mirantis, but now very actively supported by Intel folks who are working with Cloudera and Mapar fully contributed and supported by, by the Mapar team. Um, so how it grows with the ecosystem? Uh, there are 
many new frameworks in the Hadoop ecosystem uh, that are joining Apache and Hadoop uh, world. Uh, for example, Cloudera and Hotspur Wars bring in some new frameworks, each their major release. And uh, by the very pluggable uh, architecture, Sahara uh, seamlessly supports, uh, could support any new processing framework. Actually, any framework could be implemented through the plugins. Uh, and that's actually uh, the intention of the project is to uh, support the new frameworks based on the on demand and uh, integrate between them to to provide right, like a data products in stack. So right now uh, the provisioning part is a fully pluggable. So any pr any framework for the data processing could be uh, implemented as a plugin in Sahara. And the EDP part is not so pluggable right now, but it's becoming more pluggable for the transparent support for the new job types and data sources as a plugins. And our actual plan to uh, to extract all of the EDP stuff as a plugins to make it even more flexible and to uh, make support uh, easily for the for the new data sources, for example. Uh, so right now, uh, Sahara is mostly Hadoop centric, but uh, it's already contains uh, some Spark and Storm and growing to support other data frameworks as well. So. Going on, so <coughs> okay. So uh, you heard a little bit about uh, Hadoop ecosystem. You heard a little bit about how it maps into OpenStack via Sahara project. So the next question, which we usually hear at Mirantis and Red Hat, okay, how do I put this all together? And in this section, I will um, share some practical tips or some practical measurements which we did uh, on. Uh, by running uh, big data workloads on some of the test clusters and some of the best practices we came up with. Uh, I mentioned at the very beginning that we changed the title of presentation because to be honest, we wanted to bomb you with some more statistical data and performance data. But what happened is that the lab which we, are using to, which we were using to do the measurement, it became unavailable for us to some period of time. So we had to postpone some of the statistics publication. We will do it over current cycle. Still, we will give you some uh, we'll, we'll give you some best practices now and we'll also open for questions at the end. So bef again, before I start, uh, Sahara, as Sergey mentioned, is now the part of, uh, Sahara is now part of uh, official, all, all the official OpenStack distributions, including Mirage's OpenStack, including uh, Red Hat OpenStack platform, including Canonical. So you can get it pretty out installed pretty much um, anywhere automatically. Now, uh, as we go to actual do, uh, actually doing the notes, so first question we usually hear is how to compare the or how to compare running Hadoop uh, jobs on uh, in virtualized environment as opposed to running it in bare metal. How Hadoop vendors and like Cloudera and Hortonworks were usually recommending position it for you. So the rule of thumb, the number which we usually say is that uh, KVM as a hypervisor introduces roughly. Uh, 10 or lower percents of overhead for KVM itself. Uh, of course, it varies depending on the uh, on the specifics of Hadoop jobs that you are going to be running. But again, if you're talking to your manager or if you're talking to a customer, 10% or lower is usually the safe number to expose. Uh, obviously, you need to. Uh, you need, we, we recommend that you need to isolate the networks, so separate storage traffic from OpenStack management traffic, at least to make sure that uh, the traffic that Hadoop workload will generate will not kill your OpenStack cluster. It's really not nice. Uh, on the storage level for um, on the storage level for Hadoop VMs themselves, uh, the best practice recommendation is to actually use not Swift not default LVM driver, but to use block device driver. So the driver which allows to, to you pretty much to do a direct pass through of a block device into virtual machine and avoid iSCSI overhead, which is significant, especially if you attach 10 to 12 volumes to a single virtual machine. Avoid LVM overhead, which is not significant, but with LVM you cannot bypass iSCSI, so you'll have to do like this. And in such way, you will pretty much utilize the full uh, hardware disk and pass it through into virtual machine, uh, yielding the best performance. Uh, two ways to do it today, at least if you're using Mirage's OpenStack. So one is like the guy here in the link described 
configuring it manually. Okay, it doesn't work like this, anyways. Uh, second way is again, if you're using Mirage's OpenStack, there is a fuel plugin which we will make sh which we will make pub publicly available soon. If you want to test it earlier, shoot us an email. We will get we will get you to test. Uh, with which you can configure your OpenStack Cloud at the deployment time to support block device driver and allow uh, VMs to be created with with persistent storage like that. And uh, one more item here is scheduler hints passed by Sahara. So the way how Sahara works by default is that it hints uh, Nova scheduler to uh, schedule Hadoop VMs in a way when they will run on the same uh, compute node as the volume is going to be created. So in such way you preserve the main rule of running Hadoop workloads is to keep your compute as close to storage as possible. So Sahara does it by default, strives to do. Um, sample configuration, so that's the sample, the, the sample hardware plus uh, virtualized configuration for, uh, for um, a big data cluster which we once came up with for one of the customers. So here you see OpenStack compute hosts, it's quite beefy, it has two, 16 core, uh, two sockets worth of 16 cores, uh, CPU to 256 gigs of RAM, uh, simple uh, sim simple uh, simple pair for uh, OpenStack and host operating system, and 12 four, ter ter four, four terabytes uh, hard drives in JBoot mode, uh, used via JBoot. Uh, the rest of the configuration are virtualized uh, are virtualized uh, um, machines for the Hadoop uh, components themselves. So for the manager node, for master node, and for worker nodes. Um, and a couple more notes. So on the networking side, on the networking side, Sahara uses standard networks to uh, when it provisions big data, uh, when it provisions big data clusters with Hadoop. So again, make sure you separate uh, not only storage but also tenant networks, if possible, on different physical NICs, obviously, because again, nobody likes killing OpenStack because of placing too much load on the Hadoop itself. On RAM. Please don't oversubscribe. If you oversubscribe CPU, it will just get slow. If you oversubscribe RAM, it will never finish running. So, well, the usual practice with KVM, but especially relevant for uh, big data workloads. And uh, last but not least, as we were discussing with folks today, uh, with all the practices which we, which we can list here, you still are in the chance of running into poor performance or running into killed OpenStack Cloud. Uh, the key idea is that you will still, most likely for real production workloads, you will use some consulting from your big data vendor, whether it's Hortonworks, Cloudera, Mapar, or somewhere else. So again, on the OpenStack side, we can optimize for more or less generic usage of uh, Hadoop on OpenStack, but still it will very much depend on what will you will run. It will depend much more uh, on what you will run compared to when you're running generic stuff in, in the virtual machines. So if you're deploying big data, get ready to get some consultancy from folks who know big data really well, not only OpenStack. Um, some of the open problems and questions which are relevant for Sahara and for big data workloads today. So first of all, we're all working in the community to get uh, not only virtualized virtualized Hadoop for you, but also uh, bare metal Hadoop for you. So Sahara natively obviously integrates into OpenStack's capabilities to do bare metal via Ironic, though there are some specifics which one needs to account for. So for example, here right now we have the patches in the review, right? What? already merged patches for in, in the current cycle of Sahara to do some smarter things with Ironic. So for example, when uh, Sahara would be provisioning a Hadoop VM into a Hadoop um, uh, image into the bare metal node, it will also automatically take care of provisioning uh, all the available disks to be properly used by this node. So bypassing ISCASI, bypassing pretty much any, everything, including Cinder itself. Um, so one more thing in works is to allow uh, different Cinder volumes to be used separately for HDFS and intermediate storage results. And uh, things we are, which we are also looking at, which I mentioned that we will be presenting over the next development cycle, is uh, certify some reference architectures on the hardware. Uh, so this is the distribution which we use. This is the Hadoop distribution that we used. This is how much performance we get. This, this has been taken too long, so we've been focusing a lot of developing Sahara, developing plugins and so on and so forth, and not so much on the hardware certification. We're closing this gap right now. Um, 
And final, last but not least, uh, new Mac capabilities have been merged into Nova lately, mostly for NFE workloads. We also got to take a look on how to properly leverage them for big data, including things like socket affinity. So pinning the VMs to a specific CPU socket to avoid cross socket switching. That's all, already gets us beyond the level of having Sahara as an abstraction layer and having support from, for different distributions that gets us to a point of actually running it in production and making sure it get, we get most of the performance uh, available from the hardware that is used within the cloud. Questions? So how do you have the gift of part of the IP for the workload? Yep. Is there some particular way to say don't use it like with the IP rate and just say like this is the same function as that? Sergey? Why do we recommend with, uh, wh why is our default recommendation with goes with block device driver, not with Swift? Actually, the main reason is that uh, when you're working with a Swift, uh, it's implemented in a Hadoop uh, in a way that uh, you will you will access data in a Swift through, through the proxy nodes, and uh, it means that you will have a bottleneck on these nodes, and uh, like a performance will be not not so good as, as uh, you're using directly data. And uh, on the Hadoop side, uh, mostly all of the workloads are very data intensive. So you need like very performance storage. Uh, it, it could be like, dozens of terabytes of data. And so that's like the default option for us is uh, using BDD driver uh, with a directly attached disks for it. And uh, Swift could be used for some, some input or result storing. Uh, for example, results could be much, much, uh, like the size much could, could be much lower than uh, the inputs. So it seems like you can totally get off the, the loading and everything like that. Just yeah. running again, just think that you'd be doing it twice. Uh, so it's like a different case. Like if, if, if you need to, to store uh, a lot of data and uh, to intensively work on this data, like probably BDD is the only option. And if you have a uh, smaller amount of data, or you need to, to store the results that will be much smaller than input. Swift could be used for it, like as a, for example, as a persistent storage uh, in OpenStack, uh, when you will have no Hadoop clusters running, for example. There is an issue of running XDFS on top of single volumes uh, because mostly all the uh, single volumes will be backed by some uh, like distributed file system with uh, its own implementation. And you know, when you're running uh, XDFS on top of it, you will have a double duplication. And uh, if you will disable replication on a uh, XDFS side, then, then XDFS will be much lower because Hadoop acts as a replication protocol. And what if you have So we would keep uh, Cinder volumes backed by BDD. Think of it as a block device pass through directly into VM. I think we're supposed to use the mic for questions. Uh, we, we should have mentioned that earlier. Do, do you want to restate your question from the mic for posterity? Uh, so just curious <laughs> about uh, the uh, um, scaling the cluster up and down if uh, you know HDFS replicates the data. As you scale the cluster up and you add data nodes, um, the cluster has to rebalance. Is that something you find happens quickly and easily? Or like how often would you typically see people rebalancing or scaling the clusters up and down? So uh, while you're scale, scaling down the clusters, like you're doing the decommissioning before the disabling the data node. So it's, in fact, it's uh, the state of the node put to the maintenance mode, uh, like uh, only read-only, and uh, so here in it in starts the decommissioning process that moves all the data blocks to another data nodes. It's uh, for the scaling down. Uh, and for the scaling up, rebalance is uh, like, we're not doing rebalance because it's uh, like it could be endless process in Hadoop, uh, and uh, the real like 
There is no real advantages of rebalancing when you add in the new data nodes because because if you will start writing new data, it will be put on a on a free node first. It's not for edge base. So it's only for HDFS. For for edge base, you will probably need to to run rebalance uh, manually. Yeah, each base is a like very specific case for it. We, we have our object storage service based on step RGW, but not based on Swift. So when can we integrate with the step uh, instead of relying on Swift? So there are two options, basically. Uh, the first one is to use uh, the Rados gateway for Ceph that, that exposes the Swift API, but it's, uh, it will introduce a proxy nodes, uh, and the, the performance will be bad. Uh, because you, all data will go through the Zerados gateway. The another option is to use a self file system that is doing exactly the same, but uh, as a file system and the performance will be like worse performance. Uh, there is no uh, like native self support for Hadoop and uh, we're evaluating, uh, writing the Hadoop plugin to support this uh, as self uh, natively. So we're thinking about like, now it make, make sense and uh, how to implement it. Uh, we actually run uh, Ceph in, uh, in production with the Swift API and then Hadoop cluster on top of, of it with, with Swift as the data store for that. So there's that. we're going to give a talk actually tomorrow on that. So if folks are interested just to see how we're doing that, come by. It's, it's definitely a different way of doing it. So uh, does the uh, Sahara API uh, have plan to support the scenario where you know you have a separate user for creating the cluster while different group of users are you know only mind submitting jobs and getting the results? So uh, in Mintaka we have a probably in, uh, in the end of Liberty release we added the ACL support. Uh, so you could uh, you could mark the cluster public uh, and it will be public available in a uh, tenants uh, uh, in OpenStack and the users will not be able to operate the cluster itself but will be able to run the EDP jobs on it. So, uh, another question about the API. So for uh, some of these emerging Spark like uh, interactive um, uh, analytics, right, it'll be desirable the user can query the API and get the response right away if let's say you're doing a uh, query on some big data, I, but does is there a plan for the Sahara API to support that kind of model? Uh, so we don't have uh, such functionality right now, and about the plans, probably it's not in the roadmap for now. I would say probably in the V2 API, we'll we'll think about supporting the interactive queries. So the BDD driver, it's uh, in fact, uh, it's a very, very small driver that just uh, using the Virtio to attach the uh, block devices, the just hard disks from the node to virtual machine. Uh, in fact, it's just saying to, to leave Virt to add the Virtio device. Uh, the Virtio performance is just a few percent uh, slower than, uh, than bare metal. Uh, so the Virtio is like uh, like doing only very, very small overhead. It's like it's directly bypassing the disks to, to the virtual machine. So on a scale, yes, it, it will like I, I, in total the overhead will be the same one two percent for the performance. Like you're not 
it, it's not introducing the huge, uh, hu the huge difference for performance every player, but actually we were running tests and, uh, and uh, on a long running tasks, uh, you, you will never see this one, two percent even.